So welcome back everyone. Today we will talk about the intuitive concepts of limits, continuity and differentiability, the ones that we have been doing for the last two lectures. Uh, so now that now that we have done some numericals and we understand how it is done mathematically, we will try to understand how intuitive this thing is and how we can apply it to real world problems. Getting an intuitive definition is important in the first place because in that case, you know how the operation is really and if uh, that is similar to other operations that you will study later or if a completely different kind of operation matches uh, with the definition. Okay, so uh, now uh, we begin with the lecture. So first of all, we'll talk about an intuitive concept of limit. So the concept of limit of a function is essential uh, to the study of calculus. It is used in defining uh, some very important concepts there and continuity, the derivative of a function and the definite integral of a function <clears throat> all depend on limits. So limit really paves the path to concepts like continuity, uh, and then derivative or differentiability and then the definite integral of a function. Okay, so the intuitive understanding of that is that the limit of a function fx, let's say we have a function fx describes the behavior of a function so this is the function over here and if i apply let me choose a different color for that if i apply a limit operation to that what this process really means is <coughs> it describes excuse me the behavior of the function that is fx that we have described over here and that depends on the independent variable x so it describes the behavior of the function close to a particular x value okay so this is the intuitive definition of limit that it describes the behavior and i will try to highlight the word behavior of the function fx close to a particular x value so what kind of behavior do we observe well that is something which we will talk about and uh, that is that is the main question which we are trying to investigate uh, in this intuitive understanding of limits okay however when we are defining the uh, concept of intuitive uh, you know nature of the limits we do not necessarily give the value of the function at x so that's why we write limit x tends to c which is a value limit fx equals to l which means that as x approaches c so c is a number so when x the independent variable approaches this in the value which is c over here in that case the function f approaches a limit which is l okay so if i draw a graph over here that will sort of elucidate what we are trying to say over here. So let's say this is my x-axis, this is the y-axis in a standard rectangular orthogonal coordinate system. And it's the same thing though. So this is the line, this is the curve that we are considering and the equation for this curve is y equals to fx, let's say. <clears throat> fx is a function and then c is a value over here. So this is on the x-axis. So as x approaches c from both sides, we try to see where it projects on the line or the curve. So as C is being approached by X on the left hand side and the right hand side, L is being approached by the function FX either from the right hand side or from the left hand side. And so this is essentially the value L and I'll just quickly rub over here. Okay, so that's uh, just to make that thing pretty comfortable. So this is the point which is L over here. And if I try to draw a projection on the Y axis, we'll see that this is essentially the value which is here. So this is actually C comma L, okay? And the function FX either approaches from this end or from this end. And that's, that's how we are defining the intuitive concept of a limit. So when I say that limit 
f limit x tends to c it means that x is coming from either ends and then fx so fx is the curve which is described over here and it approaches the point from two sides okay so in other words what we can say that as the independent variable x gets closer and closer to c the function value fx gets closer to l so let me just write it down for you as the independent variable x gets closer and closer to c the function value which is fx so it means that when f uh, is taking on a value of x and x like f is the function which has the uh, you know dependence on the independent va variable which is x and x takes the takes the value of c so that gets closer uh, to l and in that case um, we have the definition of the limit okay that's that's how limit definition is there so note to keep in mind is that it does not always imply it does not always imply that f c is equal to l note that we are only dealing with limits that if x approaches a value which is c what is the value which f x can assume right so what is the value which f x can take once uh, x approaches c so it's approaches c and not equal to c okay so we are only emphasizing we are constantly emphasizing on the fact that uh, x is approaching the value of c uh, we plug in the values just to check uh, whether our assumption is correct or wrong but then this line this statement cannot be generalized that fc is equal to l so we cannot say this line at all okay so it can also so happen that the function might not even exist at the point c so we cannot uh, say this very clearly okay so this is an intuitive understanding of uh, what our problem is actually so this is about existence of uh, you know the limits of a function and the intuitive definition how uh, we can think about uh, the definition for the limits and its intuitive understanding so if like just like this if we consider intuitive understanding of continuity okay continuity we have constantly uh, mentioned the fact that in order to con in order to make sure that the continuity in a curve at a point exists so if i am saying that continuity of a curve at a certain point exists then three things need to be satisfied and all at once and even if one of them doesn't satisfy the point isn't continuous so the curve isn't continuous at that point that's the that's as simple as it can get which is the left hand limit limit equals to the right hand limit that is equal to the value at that point so the intuitive understanding of this problem is let's say if i have a curve over here and then we choose a point at this point which was a point over here and we are saying that let's say if this function is fx and this curve is in a rectangular coordinate system which has x and y over here so in order to make sure that the curve is continuous so if i'm approaching the curve from this end uh, we see that i have a certain value and that is defined by limit x tends to a certain value of a f x h plus x plus h that has a certain value and that is possible if i'm approaching from the left hand side and if i'm approaching from the right hand side uh, or just the reverse i approach from the right hand side and then from the left hand side which i'm showing with a different color now if i'm approaching from the left hand side i have an expression for limit which is limit x tends to a f x minus h because i'm approaching it from the uh, other end and that is what we're trying to see is equal to the value at that point so if i have fx and i replace x with that value which is a 
and then takes on a value which is fa and then these three values must be equal and in that case we have continuity and the intuitive concept of that is it must be continuous no matter which direction you come so no matter which direction you consider or take or assume uh, it should be equal and it must be equal to the value of the function at the point in order for the curve to be continuous and when i'm saying approaching this point this region is extremely small in fact this is uh this is the infinitesimal small uh, neighborhood that we are considering and in this particular region if a curve needs to be continuous if you approach the curve from the right hand side or from the left hand side you reach the curve at a point in which the curve already has that value in which the curve already has that value we did not have this limitation in limit but we have to satisfy this definition when we are doing continuity okay so that is exactly the thing that we are trying to emphasize over here that this this is a very strict definition and then that needs to be satisfied uh, once and for all okay so once this check has passed once this check has passed now we can go on to the understanding of differentiability and its intuitive nature what it really is okay so the basic concept of differentiability essentially says that let's say if you are coming from the right hand side of the curve you get a particular value of the slope so when i'm talking about differentiability i it's very wise to keep in mind this word slope over here because slope or some people say it's the gradient some people say it's the tangent whatever you say it essentially is the difference of the function divided by the difference of the independent variable that you're considering so what i mean is let's say if i do a f dash x essentially it is writing it as fx plus h minus fx divided by x plus h minus x so over here what we see that this is the difference of the function itself okay and pardon my choice of colors let's get blo it, it plots at times but that's okay so difference of the function uh this is uh, this is what the difference of the function actually is and this quantity is the difference of the independent variable okay so the two quantities are expressed over here as you can see uh, and this essentially is the gradient of the function at that point okay so if i just write it down this is the gradient of the curve at that point so if we want to check so let's say if we want to check so essentially for differentiability check the intuitive understanding comes from saying that we want to check whether the function is differentiable at a point in the curve or not so at a point in the curve which you are writing it now as fx which we are still calling it as function we are generalizing it but then uh, at, at a point in the curve uh, we need to check if a function is differentiable so this is the this is the primary uh, statement that we need to do at a point in the curve fx we need to check whether the function is differentiable okay so let's say if we have a curve over here and we are already assured that this function is continuous at that point now what we need to do is we will consider two cases so first of all we consider a case like this and then we consider a case like this in which this point has a sharp kink so this is a smooth case both of these conditions satisfy continuity so the c check is passed for both uh, now we are considering smooth case and this is the sharp case okay so let's consider a similar point over here and a point over here so at this point we see that the derivative of the function fx at this point okay uh, so that is written as fx plus h minus fx divided by h that is also known as the right hand you know the right hand part of the uh, derivative that we are considering and it yields a slope it generates a slope over here that you see over here right so the slope has a particular value that we are writing as f dash x that's the standard definition 
So this is if you're approaching it from the right hand side. Now, if you're approaching it from the left hand side, what you will see that you will get a form which resembles, which resembles the backward difference which means it's fx minus fx minus h divided by uh, x minus x minus h, which is essentially h. So this calculates the derivative of the function if you approach it from the left-hand side, okay? So if you, if you approach it from the left-hand side, you get this form, and for your understanding, I'll just try to rub this line, and that, that should be fine, okay? So this is the this is the concept that we have arrived in right now and we see that at this is these are two cases that we have considered and in most cases generally in most cases uh, the two derivatives will be the same uh, and then usually you will get for if it's a smooth case usually you won't have any issues with that and it yields the case that this is differentiable at that point which means that the slope uh, at the right side of the curve is equal to the slope at the left side of the curve is equal to the slope at that point. So this condition is satisfied. But how about this case? So the first case is satisfied. It is differentiable at this point. So this is the D check has also passed. So now when I'm trying to check the D case for this example, we see that on the right hand side, it has the particular value of a slope, which I'm marking with dotted lines. And for the left hand side, I'm marking with the dotted lines. I don't know if you can see, so I use a different color for that. Let's use the green color. And so this is the slope for the left-hand side, the slope of the right-hand side. Clearly these two slopes are different. So the D check has not passed, okay? The intuitive con the understanding of differentiability is no matter which side you come from, the slope of the curve must be the same in order to ensure that the curve is differentiable at the point. A second easy check to see is these two cases in which you can see that if there is a sharp edge over here, it suffers from a loss of differentiability. So this case is loss of differentiability. Differentiability. Okay. So this is all about the intuitive understanding of limits, continuity, and the differentiability. I would recommend that you go through uh, what we have learned today and try to take take a minute, take some time to understand what we have done so far. Okay, so at this point, uh, I think it is time that we go to the second uh, example, the second concept that we will learn today, which is, as I discussed in the beginning, we will also talk about the Taylor series and the binomial series. These two series are extremely important because this gives you a sense of approximation. Approximation. Okay, so I'll try to uh, explain you how this thing really works and how this thing has been used for, uh, you know, in almost all forms of applications, okay? So without further ado, let's just go straight into the definition. So the Taylor's theorem, Taylor's theorem, okay? So if f is a, uh, function continuous so this describes that the function f is a continuous function that we just uh, read a, a while ago and n times n is the number uh, natural number n times differentiable so the function f is differentiable up to n times so this is nth order you know function so that can be differentiated up to nth order, so n times it can be different. It can be differentiated in an interval. This also speaks about the continuity of the function. So in an interval x comma x plus h. So we see that this is a very very small neighborhood that we are considering for the function. As I've already told you, if I'm considering uh, uh, the 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 domain of the independent function, which is x to x plus h. It means that I'm considering x only within a certain uh, certain value, which is plus h and h is very small. So within a very small neighborhood, and that clearly explains how smooth that function is because this number is very arbitrary, including x, which is so arbitrary in itself. So that's why um, we can say that the function is really smooth at that point, but uh, that's not what we are, we are, we are interested in the Taylor's theorem right now. 
So if f is a function continuous and n times differentiable in an interval x and x plus h, then there exists some point, some point, it has been said very clearly, in this interval, okay, denoted by x plus lambda h, okay, for some lambda which belongs to 0 comma 1 okay which belongs to 0 comma 1 that means even within the smaller interval even within the smaller interval there is a small region okay that means between x to x plus h there is some point so you can imagine that this space is already so very small this space is already extremely small and even within the space they're claiming that there exists some point so that lambda belongs to 0, 1, that's the real number space between 0 and 1, there are infinitely many points, uh, such that, so let me take a different color, so such that f of x plus h, which means uh, the value of the function at h, so at, at that point h, is equal to fx plus h f dash x plus h squared by 2, f double dash x essentially this is a factorial but two factorial is two so let's just generalize it plus h cubed by three factorial f triple prime x plus dots up to h n minus one by n minus one factorial f n minus one we go to the n minus one derivative but we have claimed that the function has n number of derivatives so we can go ahead and take the nth derivative as well so which is fn and then x plus lambda h okay so that's something what what we can consider over here right um this is this is the primary understanding of the taylor's taylor series expansion a couple of things over here we just write a couple of things this is a technique of approximation okay for this problem fx depends only on x so f dash x is a complete derivative and not a partial one okay though in some examples you can find a partial derivative case but the idea remains the same and that is a way to approximate the information okay so now to understand what this really means let's just take it one step at a time okay so this is the definition of the taylor series expansion you can clearly see over here okay this is what we have in front of us. Now, let's go step by step, line by line, term by term. fx plus h is the value of the function f at a point, which is h times added. So that is h added to the function, the independent variable, which is x. So we're trying to evaluate the function at that point, which is h added to the independent variable. That is equal to the original function, which is fx, so that means we calculate the function f at that point x and then in order to find out in order to find out uh, what is the value of the function uh, h times when it is added uh, when h is added to x we make use of the derivative the first derivative uh, in the first place and then we go on to taking the second derivatives and then the third derivatives and so on so essentially it's the smoothness of the function that allows you to approximate what will be the value of a function when your independent variable is moved, okay? So that's, that's one of the things that needs to be considered at this point. So let's just take first three of the terms. You may pause the video at this point and just look at the expansion that I've written over here and appreciate the fact that the function f is smooth enough so that we can approximate other points in the curve using 
just the derivatives and uh, the independent variable, uh, the, the amount by which it is uh, increased. So you can approximate that, but that's a very subtle uh, way to approximate, okay? Now, since h is very small, usually for a slope calculations, for slope calculations, fx plus h, and you can find that this is very similar, plus h of f dash x, and then there are higher order terms, okay? So there are higher order terms, and that's why I've written O, uh, big O h square, you don't need to worry about that, but this is essentially uh, the higher order terms that are there, okay? Uh, so we don't need to consider that because h is really small, h is very small, okay? So we don't need to consider that. This, this automatically is trimmed, and this is assumed to be zero, okay? So now we, we can rearrange this thing and write this as fx plus h minus fx divided by h is equal to f dash x. Now, this can also be written as fx plus h minus fx divided by x plus h minus x. No harm really, because we've just added and subtracted an x over there. And this is our very well-known expression of derivative that we saw in the definition of uh, differentiability, that if I'm taking the difference of the two functions, uh, in which one function is uh, the added value to the independent uh, parameter that we are considering minus the original function divided by x plus h minus x, okay? And that is equal to f dash x. That is the standard definition of our derivatives. We do not consider terms which are larger, which is h squared, h cube, and so on uh, and so forth. Uh, but that the sole reason of that is because h is already very small and our domain of interest, which is uh, x to x plus h, is again a very small region. So h is inherently uh, pretty less and pretty small to consider when we are taking higher, pow higher powers of it. Okay, so that's the that's the standard definition uh, when we are taking the that's that's all you need to know about the Taylor's theorem for this for this course, and uh, and yes, that's that's all we need to we need to consider for the for the time being okay so then what uh, we can do is we can also see it from another perspective okay we can also see it from another perspective which is let's say if we have uh, a function which is fx right and then we need to expand the function about the point, about the point zero, okay? So let's say if I have a function fx and I want to expand the function about the point zero. So till this point, we have a very standard definition of the Taylor's theorem, and this is uh, all that you will probably need. Uh, but then if this is this is also something which comes about as an extension of the Taylor's theorem, and this is also a good way to visualize as well. So if I'm trying to expand fx about the point x equals to zero, which is x equals to zero, then the resulting series is, then the resulting series is fx is equal to f0. Okay, so at this point, what we see that I have taken x is equal to h. Okay, so or alternatively, I should write this as, in fact, I should, you know, make sure that I, I use the correct thing appropriately. So if I'm considering the function uh, f x plus h, in that case, I will have x is basically equal to zero, h is equal to x. Okay, so when I'm doing the expansion, I have f x equals to f zero, plus x f prime zero, plus x squared by two factorial, f double prime zero, plus x to the power n by n factorial, f to the power n zero, and then dots, okay? So this expansion is popularly known as the Mac-Lorentz. There's an A in the Mac. Usually there isn't, but there is now. 
So McLaurin series that you see over here, that's the one that describes the expansion above. I would suggest you think through what I did over here because this is a really subtle expansion where this is not the usual trend to do it, but then you can also see it from this perspective. And this works really well, okay? Again, if you take the first differences, what we can see over here is fx minus zero divided by x minus zero is essentially f prime zero. It is fx minus f zero divided by x is equal to f prime zero, which means I'm trying to take a derivative at the point f prime zero, okay? That's generally how these expansions uh, take place, okay? This is, uh, this is one way to consider uh, uh, the whole point. And the last for today's discussion is uh, the binomial theorem. Okay, so let me just write it down for you. I would suggest you pause at certain points to read the uh, read whatever is written and then follow it step by step and maybe you know go along. Okay, so this is a good way to you know read. Uh, these things because once you start doing them on your own it'll seem really simple no matter how difficult it seems right now now we talk about the binomial theorem and the binomial theorem has is also another form of expansion uh, so the general term is and you have probably read this in high school as well a plus b whole to the power n is equal to sigma n equals to zero or k equals to zero to n n k this is the combination parameter when you have n c k and I'll write that separately in a while a to the power n minus k and then b k and that's all you need to know about the binomial theorem okay so there's a certain pattern which gets repeated time by time and then if it's a plus b whole to the power n we can write this as first of all this k goes from an important thing to consider is it goes from 0 to n okay so let's say we have the first term over here and this is nc0, a, n, b0, so b to the power zero is one. So we have this and then nc1, a to the power n minus one, b, plus nc2, a to the power n minus two, b, okay? Square, uh, because it will have a b square now. Till the point where you reach ncn, uh, which is essentially nc0, but then now we don't have an exponent of a because now it's a to the power zero and then b to the power n. So that's about the binomial theorem. Now let's, let's, let's just take an example and then see. So for n equals to one, we have a plus b to the power one is equal to one c zero, a one plus one c one, b one is a plus b. Looks good, right? a plus b to the power one is indeed a plus b. Okay, for n equals to two, we have a plus b whole square, that is two c zero a square plus, okay, let's see, two c one a b plus two c two b square. So clearly this is a square plus two a b plus b square. Again, this two, defi this two is the definition. Okay, we know that this is how our uh, expansion happens. And on the third case that we have is, oh, we just miss it, n equals three, and then you can try for the other cases as well, but this is the general definition of a binomial theorem. Uh, and you can, you're always you know, welcome to read books and have the more knowledge about that, but this is the primary definition of that, and this is all that you will need in the exam if you're asked to write that. So a plus b whole cube is three c zero, a cube plus three C one, a square B plus three C two, uh, a B square plus three C three B cube. And that's as simple as it can get because it's a cube plus three A square B plus three A B square plus B cube. And that's exactly how the expansion goes. So you can see that all the childhood formulas that you have learned so far can be expressed in a general expression which is this, okay, which is this, and this is the binomial theorem. So today we learned about a couple of things. I would suggest you go through them, write them on your own, try to derive exactly what we have learned so far, and try to solve certain examples, and that will enrich 
your understanding about all the concepts that we have learned today. Okay, so we'll start with differential equations in the next lecture. Till then, 